So good morning, friends. This is Bob Ferguson, and I'm very, very privileged today to have with me John Norwood, who is running for Secretary of Agriculture in Iowa. And I thought it would be good to have a Life with Bob <laughs> segment with him and just find out what this guy is all about. So John, uh, you have an illustrious career spanning mm. a lot of different domains. Why don't you tell everyone why you feel you're particularly suited for this job? Yeah, thanks, Bob. And it's great to be with you here and with your listeners. And, you know, broad, broad strokes here. I, I am a, first of all, I'm a lifelong learner. And so I like to learn. I like to learn from people and connect the dots. And uh, I have pretty good vision about uh, where, where, the, where the world's heading and then <laughs> maybe how we, how we connect some of those, those dots in a way that, uh, that we can begin to build Iowa to last, the theme of my campaign. I'm a, I'm a systems and a market thinker. So, so I think about systems and markets. You know, why are systems important? Well, that's because what we have in agriculture, Iowa, Iowa agriculture is one ginormous system. It's hugely productive. We have the soils, those are a system. We have water, that's a system. We have labor, that's a system. Uh, we have, and then connected to those systems, we actually, I should say we have the biology, that's a system I meant to include that. So you get the idea, it's, it's, a, it's a web of these different systems that are interconnected. You know, water, water flows across property lines. So we have to think not just about the water on one person's farm field, we have to think about how does that water flow across farms? How does it flow through the ag tiling? We have 14 million, acres of ag tiling, 23 million acres of row crop farming, 7 million of the 14 million is controlled by drainage districts. That's a huge, enormous system. The biology that pollinates the 23 million acres, that's a huge system. And you know, at the top of that food chain is the monarch butterfly, uh, as well as all the birds that fly back and forth from the south to the north. And we just heard a, a a, a story on uh, public radio today about avian flu may be coming back. So systems are in hugely important. Markets too, why do we care about markets? Well, those are connected to the systems. You know, we use the system to produce products we call, you know, corn and beans and hogs, the animal, uh, livestock, agriculture. Those are the markets that are connected to the systems. And so that's my background, broadly speaking, markets and systems. I'm a person that operates through inquiry. I ask lots of questions. Why am I asking all these questions? You know, one of the moms said her son, I was talking, she's like, the son said to the mom, why is he asking all these questions, mom? I wanted him to talk more. Well, you ask questions because that's how you learn and that's how you make the connections. Uh, I, use, I use that inquiry. I use rationality. You know, if we, in this world today, the crazy world, we really have to use our reason that makes us who we are as human beings, use the reason to make good decisions uh, I also operate from humility, you know, the idea that I don't know all the answers, you know, <laughs> the older we get, the less we, the more we understand, the less we learn. Uh, so humility is important. Empathy is important. You know, when we're dealing with our farmers, that's one of the most stressful professions in the world, three times the suicide rate, very independent thinkers. A lot of what farmers do and farming's about is out of our control, what mother nature throws at us, what the markets throw at us. So we have to have empathy with the people who are operating in the system and trying to navigate the markets, right? Yeah. Uh, and so that empathy, uh, and, and then patience and faith are the last two values that are important to me. To me. And uh, you would find those on my Twitter account. Uh, and, uh, you know, patience is the idea that, uh, you know, we, we do need to move with intention and we need to move with with a, a sense of urgency, but we also have to do, have to have the patience to make sure we're making good decisions, and we're bringing people people along. And and then I think faith, faith, faith in Iowans, the strength of Iowans, uh, the goodness of Iowans, faith, faith in America, the power of America, uh, the the American dream, and and faith in whoever you decide is your higher power. That those are all you know a little bit about me. I grew up on the East Coast, one of the original farming communities in this country, Sudbury Plantation, founded in 1628, 10 minutes from the shot heard around the world. The farmers shot Lexington and Concord. I like yes. to remind people, farmers helped shape the world, this country. Uh, and uh, a stop on the West Coast, uh, where I, I was in agriculture in the, in the Bay Area, I learned a lot. Some of my first regenerative farming lessons were out on the West Coast back in the mid-90s, running an ag land trust. 
And uh, I picked up along the way a couple degrees, one from the Yale Forestry School with my soil science back in 1992 with the idea, who knew that soil actually is supposed to be alive, it's supposed to be living. Some of those <laughs> lessons we got to learn in Iowa here now. And um, yeah, those are, and then been in Iowa since 2002, my business TBL Ventures, it's business transformation. Where are we today? Where do we want to go tomorrow? I work with business owners around the state. One of the programs I work through is a Goldman Sachs sponsored program uh, delivered by our community colleges. I've mentored and worked with more than 50 business owners, a good number in ag or manufacturing related to ag uh, around the state. And uh, business transformation is about where are we today? Where do we want to go tomorrow? And that's essentially what we have in agriculture. You know, We have a highly productive system today, top 10 world producer. Uh, only number two in this country, the only one state beats us in the dollar value of the out ag output, California. So highly productive here, but it's tremendously unbalanced. The water quality impacts the billion pounds of nitrates, the soil loss, 145 million tons worth $3 billion a year, and the rural decline, the rural decay, decay, 70 of our rural communities and population decline, a simple measure of community health. Those are all out of balance, and that's what we need to fix. We, Why I'm running for office, building resiliency, diversity, inclusivity, flexibility into the system. So so there, there you have it. That's a little bit about me. I'll tell you, we could probably quit right there and be ahead, but uh, we will forge forward just a little bit. Sure. So what do you see, John, as the primary stressors on the yeah. system? You talked yeah. about some of the problems. Yeah. yeah. And what are some of the creative solutions that yeah. are evidence-based right now. Yeah. They're not necessarily experimental, but we may not sure. be doing them yet, but they're not experimental. Yeah. Yeah. What are the stressors and what are the things that we can yeah. do to bring this system of systems back into balance? Back into balance. That's an excellent question. Then there's a lot we can do. Uh, and, and the first thing I think is having a vision of where we want to go and why. So we got to move from the product productivity mindset that brought Nikita Khrushchev here in 59 and President Xi here from China in 1980s to learn about the productivity of the system. If we want to sustain it, you know, we've lost a third of the topsoil in places, a half to two thirds of the soil organic matter, uh, which, which, which relates to that biology I spoke about and to the performance of the soil, its ability to withstand, you know, what mother nature is going to throw at us in terms of the more intense and extreme rainfalls and droughts, we, we've, got, we've got to build in resiliency and diversity into what we do. And so there, there are three things. I ran on this as a soil and water commissioner, these concepts back in uh, 2017. And as part of a strategy, a true strategy, what we have today with that nutrient reduction strategy is not, it's not a strategy because it doesn't deal with a uh, uh, specific, it doesn't have a, the resources dedicated to, to to, to the size of the, the challenge, the 23 million acres worth $350 billion. It doesn't have a priority, prioritization of the specific tactics, what are called tactics. You know, if you put in a biorefilter, you can, you can reduce the nitrates by this amount, or if you put in a saturated buffer, this will be the result. Those are all tactical uh, aspects. And, and what we really need is a strategy. Which ones of these things do we do and why? And, and how do we scale this thing? And so as a soil and water commissioner, one of the th concepts I said, we got to work on the infrastructure. There's a big infrastructure part of this. That's the ag plumbing. That's the 14 million acres, 7 million controlled by drainage districts. And we can't fix this one at a time. We can't fix this. It's like thinking about our interstate highway system. Hey, let's build the interstate highway system and we'll just go to each landowner and see, hey, you want to build a part of the interstate, you know, uh, <laughs> highway system? You know, I'm how do you think about right. it? How the heck would that work? Right? So- <laughs> Uh, we at Polk County, I, I flipped it on its head how we were doing saturated buffers. We were doing like one, one or two of these a year and the state had a, a few. And I'm like, you know, why are we doing it this way? And the response was, well, this is how we've always done it. Well, this makes no sense. I remember the listening, the active listening. And I sat down with the drainage contractor. And guess what? He said, John, this makes no sense either from the drainage contractor perspective. <laughs> the guy so who's we, making we, money doing it, right? Yeah, he's like, we know this is ridiculous. We don't, this is a side job for us. We're in the business of putting in trialing. So we flipped it on its head and we reimagined and we used our, our mapping tools and targeting and, and landowner outreach. Guess what? 60% of the of the land, the ag land is not owned by the person driving the tractor. So our conservation staff were running around talking to the person driving the tractor about something that they don't, they're not the decision maker on, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's like a huge disconnect. We're not even talking to the right people. 
So we just delivered a project, Polk County did, of 50, 50 saturated buffers and bio, bioreactors. I think we close to double the number the state had ever done, and then we were doing 100 this coming year, and we're teaching the other counties how to do this, and my opponent says, hey, this is great. Uh, we're going to do this all over the state. The only thing he's sort of forgotten to do is tell other people that he didn't come up with that idea, <laughs> even though he celebrated, you know, the the, the, the oh, launch hey. of that. <laughs> was, right. Yeah, and then he sort of forgot on Iowa Press. He said, "Oh, we had already invented this." Okay, well, why did we yeah. celebrate it? Then? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, um, the, there's a big infrastructure part, and it has to do with working with our drainage districts. There's 3,500 of them. There's over 100 billion dollars invested in these drainage districts. And we need to broaden the mission, not just to drain the water, but conserve it, manage it, uh, hold it in the soil, uh, you know, mitigate flooding and so forth. And why do we want to do that? We'll go look at California and see how well agriculture works if we don't have any water. And look at <laughs> Iowa today, parts of Iowa, it's a drought. So we can't just send it all down the river. So that's point one. Second point is soil health. Soil health is hugely important, that biology of the soil. If it performs, then it can infiltrate those high intensity rainfalls, the four, five, six, inch rains, oh my gosh, you have, you have cover crops, cop, you, have, you have root structure, you have soil health, the biology, that water goes into the ground versus running it off uh, the degraded soils, which we have way too many of, for, for behaving more like concrete. And so uh, there's two benefits. One is the, that high intensity rainfall, we infiltrate uh, that water and, and uh, so that mitigates the flooding. Well, how much water can that soil hold, John? Well, for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, we're talking about 27,000 gallons per acre. All right, well, that sounds like a lot. Well, but, you know, give me some context. Okay, well, let's take 10 million acres times 27,000 gallons per, per acre. How much water is that? It's a heck of a lot of water. That's 1.3 Sailorville lakes at flood stage. Back in the soil, it's, it's enormous. It's probably one of the most important things we can do, probably as important, if not more important than the infrastructure part that I just told you about is to get the soil so it actually performs. And you know the cover crops, we have uh, maybe 2 million, two to 3 million acres of you know, the 23 million we farm. I mean, how does that, does that sound like a passing grade, three out of three out of 23? You know, <laughs> maybe in my opponent's world, but not in mine, we're not moving anywhere quick enough. And, and the problem, some of the problems, when you start to listen and you talk to people, you got the guy on the, the, the John Deere X9 tractor. Well, what's the X9 tractor? That's the new fancy John Deere. It's like the Ferrari of the tractor world. It's all about speed. And do you think that guy cares about soil health? Well, I went met with one of them and he said, I don't care about soil health. I'm too busy on my X9 trying to cover. I just added another 1500 acres. And so, you know, we got to think about, well, how do we actually get the soil health done if the guy driving the X9 tractor isn't interested? And, and he has a lot of acres to cover. And he says to me, well, we just had a nine, we just had a seven and a three and a half inch rain out here. I don't know what soil health is. I don't have time for cover crops. What he didn't say to me was, oh, well, guess what? We, we lost part of our crop, a big part of our crop because there was standing water and, uh, and, 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 and the federal crop insurance bailed me out. So we have Hers. moral, we have more, yeah. it's called in the insurance world, we have moral hazard. We are using the insurance to cover people who are making bad decisions or who are not making the decisions. Not necessarily, this. they're not bad people, but they're just not incentivized. It's like the bad driver. You know, I keep cracking up the car and this is, you know, I don't really, you know, the insurance company keeps giving me a new one. <laughs> so, you know. How does that give you a new one? Uh, yeah, yeah. And you so, don't die, right? Yeah, so there's another example, you know, some of the financial incentives. Farmers, typically the farm operators are rational decision makers. And if we begin to adjust the public's, uh, in, you know, the public's role, which is supporting the marketplace, but not just with productivity. You know, the 1950s mindset was just go produce all, as much as you can. We don't really care what happens. This is great. You know, let's just keep doing more. That old Mae West uh, uh, quote that Warren Buffett likes to talk about. Well, no, <laughs> that we do more, more of something that's too much is leading to our water quality and our, and our it, a, a massive soil erosion. So we got to align federal policy we got to stop planting corn and beans in stupid places down in the two-year floodplain. You know, maybe stupid is, is the wrong word. Maybe in, in places that we could be doing other things that would make more sense, right? And, uh, you know, maybe there's CRP and that's where the cattle ought to be running around. There's a relationship, a balance that we need to restore with, with livestock. Livestock in, in, in the cropland, super important because the 
the manure, the poop coming out of the back end of that animal has the biology that's connected to the soil, right? That helps accelerate the regenerative agriculture that you were just, uh, we were talking before the show about. So that's the second thing. The third thing has to do with diversification of what we grow. We got to introduce third and fourth crops at scale into the corn and bean rotation. Why do we need to do that? Well, for a couple of reasons. From a systems perspective, remember we talked about systems. Uh, the soil health requires uh, diversity in what we grow. The bugs and the biology want diversity. If we just grow the same things, pesticide pests start popping up. Then we start spraying everything with, with, with more chemicals and the chemical companies say, oh, this is great. We're selling more product. You know, you know what could be better? Well, you know, we've blown out the soil biology. And so then it doesn't provide the nutrients that it could. Some of those nutrients could be provided by the soil. Well, you know, the co-ops and everybody else, this is great. We get to sell more inputs, you know? So uh, we're, we're, we've created a dependency in the system that is hurting us. And so, you know, like the alcoholic, the first thing we need to do is recognize we have a problem and, and then we can begin to understand what to do. So the diversification from the systems it has to do with the soil health, that third and fourth crop. Well, what might the third crop, crop be? Well, it could be small grains, could be oats. Let's talk about oats for a second. Uh, Land in Plaguey up in Franklin County grows a thousand acres. And I just went and visited him. And some people say, oh, you can't grow oats. There's no market and you can't make any money. Well, Landon shows me his seven and a half inch row planter. That was a pea planter he brought from Illinois. And I said, well, why, you know, why seven and a half inch rows? He's like, John, I can double my yields. Now I get 150 pounds or 150 bushels per acre. And I said, okay, well, where do you take your, your, uh, your, your, your oats? He says, well, I take it to grain millers. And I said, well, what do they do with it? And he says, well, you know, one of the things they do is they make, uh, they make oat milk with it. Oatly makes oat. And I said, okay, that's great. And then he starts telling me about Quaker oats. And I, over in Cedar Rapids, one of our biggest plants, you know, a, a food grade um, uh, oat processing. And he says, you know what, John, the, 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 uh, do you know where the oats from for the Quaker oats facility come from? Do you know this, Bob? No, I don't. They, <laughs> they, uh, they don't come from Iowa. They come from Canada. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. Well, Iowa didn't, you know, they couldn't grow the right test weight and so, so forth. Well, Brandon, uh, Landon says to me, no, no, we, I can grow the right test weights now. So, you know, that's an example of the disconnect. If we want farmers to grow different things in Iowa, besides corn and beans, we have to have the processing infrastructure, right? So the processing Absolutely. infrastructure, some of that we see can't even process what we produce or could produce here. And so people say, well, we don't have any markets. Like it's some impossibility that we, we couldn't possibly solve. We couldn't possibly do that, right? You know, yeah. And then the Kia Cook is another story. You read the story, oh, we're shutting down the Kia Cook plant for producing wheat. And there's, you know, the guys all left who knew how to do the water quality part. And, and then you ask, well, where did the wheat come from? Well, the wheat doesn't come from Iowa or it didn't come from Iowa. And so, you know, this, this is sort of almost like, you know, why... Uh, why is it we only grow corn and beans here? Well, because you know we've we've deconstructed or we've let right. fall apart or we haven't reinvest. Pick whatever word you want. We haven't supported any of these other markets. Well, who 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 thinks that way? Yeah. Well, monopolists think that way. Monopolists <laughs> think about you know we we the way monopolists operate. They say, well, we don't want to have any competition. And uh, isn't this great? If there's no competition, then we get to tie up the market. And we can raise prices. And well, what's happening with our input suppliers and with with our market processors and the <laughs> cattle and the and the pork? And we're scratching our head and saying, well, why? How why is this the, happening? The right? Farmers are being <laughs> screwed. Well, because we've created essentially a, a monopolistic uh, the mon the monopoly game is Iowa, right? We got the monopoly board, and there's only two pieces, or three pieces. And so we have we have to add that's that diversification. Now the other part of diversification story is also well, what are the, you know, we got the, I just described Bob. He's on the X9 tractor, and maybe we can get him to start, you know, growing a third and a fourth crop. He said he did say, John, if you know if it pays, I'll do it. Uh, but you know, I've tried it before and it, it didn't work. So didn't we need to give we got to give Bob some training too. Now now we've got now we've got uh, you know Suzanne and and uh, and Barney. Uh, you know, and, and they're two to two hundred, a thousand acres. They're like, John, don't forget about us. We've got an integrated system, but 
we don't have any place to take our animals. You know, we got to take them 200 miles and we got to, we got to book out six miles, six months or wait, 18 months to process. And, you know, we don't, we don't have any processing capacity. So just like with the crop example, I just gave you the grain example. Uh, and don't forget hemp too. I want to talk about hemp. And, uh, and then, so, you know, the animals, they say, well, we need pride. We need, yeah, we need to have local control, local ownership, regional ownership of processing, maybe not a processing in each uh, county maybe there's some of this is regional and then you have the you know the meat packers the family meat packers the guy's 65 and he wants to retire and there's nobody there to you know we got to teach the next generation we have Random, to have incentives right? yeah so that's the mid-size you know support and then down at the beginning size i run around and people say i say well what are your problems and they say we can't even get access to land john i'm 30 something or 20 something and i just want five acres i want 10 acres oh the county tells me i'm not a farmer you know, because I don't have 40 acres or more. So then I, they don't even the, the zone me and they, then they start throwing all these permits at me if I want to, you know, host a barn event or something. And as school kids come running by, they want me to charge me 200 bucks for a conditional use permit. I mean, it's ridiculous. So at the low end, you know, we've got to figure out how do we, how do we do, how do we, you know, get small people, get them into the profession. I mean, I say to people, well, how do you get into farming typically in Iowa today? Well, I mean, I've 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 got some I've got some answers here that we that we see here and popping up in Jefferson County and other ways, but uh, it is very difficult it, for all yeah. reasons for all typically, the reasons you said. Yeah, but, you typically know what, what strikes me, John, yeah. is that um, you know there's a great old saying that says men and probably meaning men and women set up the images in their mind and then sit among them bemoaning their fate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We, we, who's responsible for this system? Oh, we are, we yeah. created it, but it, it, created. Cre it creates itself over so many years, depending on, yeah. on, on values. So it, it strikes me to kind of, you know, wrap up here um, yeah. and we'll, we'll maybe do, do an interview too. This yeah, is too, sure. too fascinating to stop. But um, what strikes me is that we, if we're going to get better, we need to think different thoughts. And the different thoughts need to be in the arena of systems thinking, systems of systems, yep. and markets. And how do you yep. support that yes. at the beginning level or the root yes. here? But you know, what, what strikes me is that 50%, I understand 50% of all jobs are created by small businesses. Small yep. businesses are at small. Least, they're least. not, they're ox, you know, they're, yeah. a, they're a small business. So yeah. why can't we apply that principle in the ag sector? Absolutely. So the, the, you know, I think right now in Iowa, typically the way you get into agriculture, you, people say well, you either inherit or you're born on the farm. And that's a game of musical chairs. If we're just focused on the commodity systems, which are an important part of what we do, but as those scale, those bigger tractors, bigger farms, there are fewer seats left. So the new seats we create through something, a concept I call a farm park. You can go to Norwood, the number four, iowa.com and see, and see that farm parks are like a business park or an industrial park, but focused on food farming because we have 80 million people within a day's drive. We've, it's a $1.5 trillion domestic market. It's a big market. And, you know, being in the center of the country, that's an advantage over California. It rains here sometimes. That's an advantage. We have high quality soils. That's an advantage. Great universities. That's an advantage. Hardworking people. That's an advantage. We can do this here if we want to. And the, the, the farm park basically is let's go find 100 acres in each county and do something different. Let's provide that small scale access that's bringing the infrastructure, the water, the power, you know, indoor agriculture, which, get, by the way, you can do that year round. Let's look at hemp, the CBG oil facility down in Ottumwa. That's not, you know, top line 500, 600 to 1500 dollars an acre. It's a million dollars an acre. There's a there's a wide disparity. <laughs> a lot of money. Of the value a lot of money in those specialty crops. Yeah, and so you know, people say, well, we, you know, there's no place to get any ground, John. You just you're just pie in the sky. And I say, well, you know, the history of because uh, I'm a history guy too. Are are you uh, you know the history of Iowa and poor farms? They say, oh yeah, you know, we we might understand what poor farms were, and that's where we helped people. Blah blah blah. We had farmland. I said, well, where's the? You ask the county people. Well, do you guys have any of that poor farm ground? They, and they look at their shoes, and then they say, oh yeah, we do. Well, and you say, well, what are you what are you doing with it? And they say, well, we rent it out to the conventional corn and bean farms. Well, there's your land. There's some of your land for your for your farm park right there. And that's how you get the new. You know, if you want people. If you want your community to survive, you care about the schools, you care about the hospital, you care about the decaying bridges, well, you got to have people living 
and make it welcoming and give people something to do out there. I mean, the story today about Dollar General is popping up. Well, Dollar General is just a symptom of, a, yeah. of these communities that are out of balance. So give them something to do and you'll know you're on the right track if, if the young people actually stay or young people start coming. And, you know, but you got to be ready. Some of them may not look and think like you, right? They might not be from this country. They might be black skinned or brown skinned or, oh my gosh, they might be from Massachusetts or California, you know? Oh, how perish the thought. <laughs> my gosh, if people actually came from outside of Iowa to live here. So, anyway, those, those are some thoughts. It's been great being with you here to, today, Bob, and I'll look forward to more conversation. Well, John, this is really fabulous. This is so much fun. And I think I think more than anything, we need a sense of self-efficacy. You know, that's defined as the internal feeling that we can cause, bring about, and make happen what we choose. Mm. And I think this conversation is really an efficacy builder. Mm -hmm. It's just so enjoyable to think and to hear about actual solutions that really take in what's actually happening and real mm-hmm. solutions, not, not, you know, putative solutions or solutions yes. that aren't really solutions. So anyway, to be continued, John Norwood, thank you very much. You're welcome, Bob. <laughs>